So why did I Good morning, Morgan County and the community. Welcome. It's time for the Partnerships Positive Podcast. From the Morgan County Partnership with our hosts, I'm Mrs. Hot, the Positive Actions and Digital Media Facilitator, and we have... Hi, hola, es hora de acción positiva. Hi, community, I'm Mrs. Shema, Morgan County Partnership, Positive Action and Digital Facilitator. Hey everyone, I'm Miss Nikki here, um, Positive Action, Too Good for Drugs Coordinator. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Awesome. The Morgan County Partnership joins you weekly for an exciting look at positive programs, news, and features to help us all build empathy, foster core values, health, and family wellness in our homes, communities, and around the world. Whether you are 2 or 92, each new Partnership Positive podcast we will feature fun and exciting information to help you manage and balance life here in Morgan County to West Virginia and below. And we are so happy to offer weekly public service announcements with core value discussions to help us build strong families. Yay! Let's get started! Awesome! So guys, we have been sharing this week on our digital media, how empathy can change the world, that making an intentional effort to really listen to others, to listen to their story and to make a connection with others, especially those who are different from us, is a potent force for change. Tell us guys, what's coming up next? Well, we continue with today's positive preset from Pasada.com. Here it is. Every human being of whatever origin, of whatever station, deserves respect. We must each respect others, even as we respect ourselves. Oh, Miss Shema, that is beautiful. What do you think it means? Hmm, I see a core value that it's essential today and always in our positive preset of this week. Respect. Respect. Oh, Miss Shema, you're right. It says every human being of whatever origin, of whatever station, deserves respect. We must each respect others, even as we respect ourselves. And that was said by Yu Fant. Who was he? Anybody know? Well, I have a little information. Uh, Yu Fant was a Burmese diplomat and yeah. Burmese, thank you, Burmese diplomat and the third United Nations Secretary General. He was widely praised for his diplomacy and peacekeeping skills, which were frequently needed during his turbulent period as UN Secretary General during the late 60s. Another turbulent time in history following the civil rights movement and Vietnam War. The 1960s were one of the most tumultuous and divisive decades in world history, marked by anti-war protests, political conflict, etc. Wow. It sounds like you then also live in a time when, re when respect for others was very important too. That's right, guys. Respecting self and others then, back in the 60s and now, is an essential positive action. And you, Thant, to me, builds respect using that good old golden rule. Did y'all hear that? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Yeah. Respect others the way you want to be respected, too. Now, coming up with Miss Nikki's positive PSA, it'll help us all to understand more about respect, right? That's right, because we need respect in our homes, our neighborhoods, and our world. It sure is important. You're right, Miss Nikki. And for positive actions this week, we'll be looking at the important core value, respect, at home and in our community. Respect is a choice we make, beginning with a positive thought, and then we can take that action, and those actions will indeed change the world. And won't that feel positive? Positive thoughts, actions, and feelings. Right, guys? Mm -hmm. Let's listen to this. What is respect? Respect 
is really about love. So when we respect our community, we start to help one another. Where does respect start? It starts with you. That was awesome. I love how they said respect starts with you. Beautiful. What are positive programs do we have coming up in our neighborhood this week? So why did I miss? What did I miss? Mm. Virginia, my home sweet home, I want to give you a kiss. Mm. I'm in Paris meeting lots of different ladies. I guess I basically missed the late 80s. I traveled the wide, wide world and came back to this. let's take a look we don't want our families friends and communities to miss the fun online programs we have for our neighbors we're going to start this week with respect that's our next positive action word and the morgan county partnerships upcoming daily wellness programs on social media and for our schools begin each week with moto monday or motivation monday it features a fun vlog cast from Mrs. Hot and Mrs. Shayma to murder up our summer weeks with a video that you'll see this week on Monday, a teen showing respect for seniors. It's a beautiful story, you guys. So be sure to turn in and watch what special thing this teen does. And for our teens out there, Mrs. Hot wants you to show respect this week to a senior citizen you may know. And what's on Tuesday, guys? On Tuesdays, it's Tucked In Storytime. For July 28th, we feature the new PBS Race and Diversity book series. Violet will be reading Her Love by the Academy Award winning creator Matthew Terry. Remember, each book is following by fun. Let's talk about it questions for families and schools lessons too. That's cool. Hey, did you guys see WDVM's story about the Race and Diversity series? Sure, I did. If you miss it, yeah, be, so sure, great. be sure to check out our future on social media. Then on Wednesdays, it's Positive Yoga for Kids with Lacey. She's looking for your yoga poses, so make sure you guys send her some. Uh, last week, we saw some new poses and relaxation games. If you haven't joined Positive Yoga for Kids, each lesson is perfect for first-timers. For families either working from home or at the office, many of Lacey's guided yoga stretches provide wellness right at your desk, too. That's awesome. Well, on Thursdays, stay tuned for Miss Nikki's Positive Parents PSA Future for Families on social media. And again on Thursdays for the rest of the summer, Violet returns with more of the PBS Race and Diversity stories. And for July 30th, we continue with another beautiful story called My Hair is a Garden by Cosby A. Kabira. And on Fridays, the Partnerships Positive Podcast each week, join us for our new awesome words, I'm Still Here Family Auto, Auto Book Chapter, positive stories, community talent. And finally, stay connected Morgan County. Get our Morgan County Partnership free mobile app. Go to Apple Store or Google Play. And this July, when the neighborhood out there, you load the app for this month, you could win AirPods or a grocery gift card from Food Lion. So we've been watching these numbers. We've had over a hundred more loads of our Morgan County Partnership mm -hmm. app on devices just this month. So keep loading our app to keep connected and we will let you know who the winner is. And, and Ms. Shema, uh, could you tell us what do they need to do in order to enter the contest? If you have an Instagram, go to our Positive Actions Instagram and we have a picture that it's a giveaway and you can see there the instructions to play and it's just you have to comment share the picture with the hashtag join MCP app and you're gonna enter to win a gift, gift lion um, 
car AirPods. Yeah, or AirPods. That's so much fun. Now, I know y'all coming up next week, I think it is, is the MC After 3 Summer Camp. So you campers out there, if you're going out to the state park with Summer Goller for camp and you've got your phone or device, load that app because you might want to win some AirPods and listen mm-hmm. to the podcast, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. That is so cool. Why well, do you guys, next week's programming is full of wellness things about respect. Uh-huh. And for our parents and caregivers, let's listen to our PSA from Miss Nikki all about respect. Miss Nikki, are you ready? I am. Um, looking up some things on respect, you know, it's great that you mentioned earlier um, the golden rule, do unto others, because that's basically how you demonstrate respect. Um, be polite to everyone. Um from your family members, to your coworkers, to the people at the grocery store. Um, listen, be helpful, don't make excuses, um, and be willing to change. Sometimes we're too busy thinking of what our response is gonna be, we forget to listen. But to be respect, um, it means that you accept somebody for who they are, even when they're different from you or don't agree with you. Um, Respect in your relationship builds feelings of trust, safety, and well-being, and that just builds a more positive family. So it's all, respect kind of entwines all the words that um, we've discussed here on Positive Actions, I think. That's beautiful, Miss Nikki. And and you gave us that that starting with the thought on let's respecting others. That's the positive thought. And you gave us some actions we can do too, like um, being kind to each other um, and people within our families and our neighbors um, next door. And uh, so let's. I think we should try that because when we show respect, it helps us feel better too, doesn't it, Miss Shayla? Yes. I, when I I feel positive when I feel respect and when I show respect to someone else it makes me feel good too. Definitely. What do you guys think? Yeah, mm-hmm. Definitely, yes. And you feel oh, important. I totally agree. And I, I think it's really important, especially now, because um, I don't know, somehow we become this idea that if you don't agree with me on something, then you must be this terrible person, you know, and that's just not the case. Um, oh. We need to be respectful of others' opinions. You know what, guys? I think too, Nikki. You said especially now, and you fan. He he put he said this phrase and put it as the golden rule, like like you let off with. And in his time in the '60s, that was a crazy time too. And mm-hmm. and here again today, it's 2020, and and the world's crazy. And and we still need to follow that golden rule. And and like you said, especially now, you know what? I think sometimes people, because our world is way more digital now than it was in 1960, we still need to show respect if we're using technology and Mm -hmm. and we're not getting to see people i I feel like sometimes in in following comments and things um people feel like oh well this is social media i can i can just say anything and it's sort of cowardly don't you think Mm -hmm. it is i i feel like you know what community neighbors it we're not seeing each other as much as we used to because of the situation in the world but we still got to follow that golden rule and respect each other in the digital world as well. Um, I got to tell you, over the weekend, I saw where um, over in Washington County, people were just saying some terrible things. And, and I feel like, you know, would, would someone really do that if they were face to face? You know, so exactly. And, you know what I, mean? I did a, a lesson at the middle school a few years back and we had a, a no social media challenge we had 14 days to stay off social media but we talked about that it's like think about when you go to type something would you say that to the person if they were standing right in front of you and most of the time the answer is no you would not so you gotta gotta remember think about the other people when you start typing sometimes you might have to delete instead of hit send (laughs) <laughs> yep, you're absolutely right. And, and it's important right now, um, especially uh, you fan had it right. We respect ourselves because we and we respect others. And and it's important to show respect to everyone equally in, in this day and age and do that with positive thoughts, actions, because if you if you just try it, neighbors, you're going to feel so much better showing someone different from your respect. 
Exactly. That's my challenge. Let's try it. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. We and still have. Thank you, Miss Nikki. What an awesome parent PSA for our families. And um, on the podcast, remember on Thursdays we do a preview um, each week on social media on what the parent PSA is going to be all about. And um, when I when I can, guys, I slip it in on our Moto Monday too because I think this um, when we have a discussion about the word and we know what it is from Miss Nikki, it helps us launch our week with a positive thought so we'll have great actions also oh my goodness what's next it's time for announcements announcements announcements, announcements. Woo! there is so much stuff you guys oh to do right here at home i love it let's look at what's happening this weekend in morgan county any ideas hmm did you know that the Washington Post recent feature a fun, a full page story in the magazine about summer and at the springs? <gasps> Come experience it today. Splashing in the spring pools, farmers markets, shopping, spa, dining out. Burke Springs is ideal every day. It is, you guys. And Miss Shema, I did not know the Washington Post. That's really cool. <gasps> yeah, I know. It's amazing. I read, yeah, I read about that, but I didn't see it. But you can certainly look it up. Summer in the Springs here in Morgan County. Something else I saw that was pretty cool in berkeleysprings.com. Um, Berkeley I saw this announcement. It said this. Yep, it's hot even here in the mountains y'all been hot this week uh -huh. oh oh my goodness like the heat index has been over a hundred and community and neighbors it is hot even here in the mountains but there are water areas everywhere for cooling down morgan county has lakes rivers and the springs right downtown. I drove by 522 a couple days ago and the springs had people, they were social distancing, but they were cooling off in the natural springs in right downtown Berkeley Springs. Also, you say you like to hike maybe? If you head west along the Washington Heritage Trail National Scenic Byway and cross the Potomac from our westernmost town, Paw Paw, you can stroll through the nearly mile long Paw Paw Tunnel. It's the largest man-made structure on the CNO Canal. And it's really like the temperature because it's dark in there. Uh, Talk about cool and refreshing when you go through the tunnel if you're if you're feeling that heat index, right, Miss Nikki? Oh yes, we were there a couple months ago and we walked through and it was incredibly so much cooler in there. It's also a little dark, so make sure you take a flashlight. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Everyone should try it. What else is coming up? Uh, let's see. Uh, this week we have the annual um, Mountains Quilt Show opens at the Ice House Gallery. Um, quilters have been very busy under stay-at-home orders and there are more than 100 quilts on display and for sale along with numerous smaller fabric items. Uh, one that is not for sale because it is to be a gift for the people of Morton County is the spectacular group bicentennial quilt with 34 squares showing highlights of county history and splendors and it was created by 19 women um, i saw that and it's beautiful so you should see it in person um, the gallery hours are thursday through mondays 11 a.m to 5 p.m and the quilts are displayed in the galleries on the two floors with plenty of spacing for you and masks are required you saw the quilt, Nikki? I did. I was at the celebration, the Bicentennial Celebration oh. in the park, where it was a really hot day also. But yes, I got yeah. to see the quilt. Beautiful. I did. I, ha I haven't. They're amazing. Aren't they gifted on what they, they, I think it's an art on what they can use fabric to create. I didn't yes. see the quilt, but I did see a and picture. Each square has a different um, meaning or history uh, kind of lesson to it, I believe. It's oh, gorgeous. that's cool. Hmm, maybe that's something we can share when school starts up in the fall. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Miss Nikki. Let's see what else. How about this? Stress relief is tops on everyone's list and maybe a facial or a pedicure too. Whatever indulgences your body needs are safely available in the spas of Berkeley Springs. 
check out the menu of more than 52 different treatments at berkeleysprings.com, plus a bonus of free yoga with Hiroko in Berkeley Springs State Park every Saturday at 9 a.m. Please bring your own mat. Now, I noticed on their social media, they've had pictures of Hir Hiroko's yoga on Saturday morning. It looks awesome. They are social distancing, so it's safe and healthy. And you know what, guys? I really want to go, but I can't get myself out of bed that early. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yeah. <laughs> It all sounds wonderful. And neighbors and visitors, I like remember to visit many restaurants for outdoors dining and live music this weekend too. Uh, now open at Cape and State Park is a new beginner level mountain bike trail named Rock and Roll, just downhill from the Nature Center. There are two loops, an inner, which is 1.2 mile loop, um, that's the easiest, and a more challenging one mile outer loop. Um, it's about five inches wide, flowing trail that's suitable for everyone. Uh, please note in West Virginia, by law, helmets are required for 14 and under, and the park requires helmets on everyone riding the mountain bike trails. So remember that um, if you just want to walk or run the new trail, you can. Um, but on this trail, hikers have to yield to the bikers, so remember that. Um, I did talk to Mr. Harris, the principal at the middle school, and they hiked on the bike trail and he said it was oh. fantastic. So um, we wanna thanks to the park and all the volunteers and the supporters that made that possible. I think it's gonna be great. That's cool. And I think Mr. Miguel told me that he was out running the park on over the weekend. Did he miss Shema? Yeah. They have like a race for 12 hours. So you have to run at the, the Cape Moon State Park. 12 hours running in the mountains. Yeah. 12 Ooh. hours. <laughs> wow. Well, That's neighbors, Mr. Mr. Miguel is a very good runner. He has <laughs> lots of experience. And as a matter of fact, he also hosts, he has on our um, app a video from YouTube mm -hmm. um, where you can run with him and he talks about words in Spanish. It's pretty awesome. So any high schoolers out there, if you have Mr. Miguel for Spanish this year, um, check out the app on our, uh, check out the YouTube channel on our app where he runs and, and talks about some words. You might find something you'll need to know in the classroom <laughs> and you could go for a run with Mr. Miguel yeah. <laughs> and look at some Spanish words too. I think that's pretty cool. Now there are also other outdoor adventures here in Morgan County out at Kiki. It includes an 18 holes, 18 hole golf course, exceptional golf course. There's also a lake with a sand beach and a really cool playground. I do see on social media a lot. Um, people are out at the playground with their families, uh, sharing, having some great quality family time together. And people are being respectful of and healthy of social distancing. So there's a lot of stuff you can do right here in the neighborhood, right, guys? Kikapin also has wobble clay shooting and horseback riding. Now, I didn't know this, but Violet told us last week, horseback at Kikapin State Park is operated by Good Luck Stables. Isn't that cool? And I met Krista from the stables who works with Violet at the cheese shop and the farmer's market on the weekends. And Krista was telling me that their horses are just amazing. Now guys, here's something else I wanted to share. Krista also is a baker. And it's kind of cool because she's a graduate from Barbara Ingram where Isaac and Levi go to school. She's a graduate in opera. Isn't that interesting? That's she's an cool. opera singer. Yeah, she's home also because of the pandemic with her family working at the stables and she's baking. So Miss Krista is baking something special for my mom. You guys want to know what it is? <gasps> what is? You got to promise not to tell because no, it's no, a surprise. I promise. I promise. Well, grandma is turning 80 on Saturday. <gasps> So Krista is baking her a very special birthday cake and it took a lot of investigating, but we did discover that Mary McBee's favorite cake is carrot cake. Oh. So yeah, so Krista from Good Luck Stables and the cheese shop um, where, where Violet works with her, she's gonna bake this cake for her. I'm so excited, but remember y'all don't tell her, okay? Okay. It's a surprise, it's a surprise. secret. You don't turn 80 every That's day, awesome. do you? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Celebrate. Wow. 
All right, what's next? Okay, guys, you know what? It's time to get ready and close our positive podcast for the week. Are you ready? This was fun, right? Yes. Wow. So Mary McBeat's going to turn 80. That's exciting. Happy birthday. (laughs) Well, community, from 2 to 92, young and old, it's been fun podcasting with you today. We hope you find some positive action out in the world this week. And when you do, tell us about it, please. Email your story to share it to Angie at morganpartnership.org. Bye. I had so much fun today too, guys. And remember neighbors, if you have a need at your house, the Morgan County Partnership is here to help you connect and find the resources to build strong relationships at home and to unify our community. You need help with groceries, looking for a wellness meeting, um, is addiction an issue for you or a loved one? The Morgan County Partnership can help you um, locate those local resources. Remember, you are not alone. Thank you, Miss Nikki. And you are not alone. You're also unique. You are important and you each are wonderfully made. Thank each of you for joining us for the podcast today. All right, guys. So let's close now our positive podcast with our really cool segment to our program. Are you ready? Sure. Last week, our audio chapter of Austin Channing Brown's book, I Am Still Here, Black Dignity in a Word Made for whiteness. This week we hear chapter five, witness at work. Right, chapter five, whiteness wow. at work. That sounds so relative. I can't wait to share this chapter with you neighbors. And remember, each week we hear a new chapter and you can also listen to continued audio chapters on the Partnerships mobile app, or you can go to our playlist on Positive Actions YouTube. So to conclude today's podcast, it's I'm Still Here. Violet, are you ready? Here we go. I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. Chapter five, whiteness at work. Confession, by the time I graduated from college, I thought I was the white culture whisperer. I was fearless. I thought any future encounters of racism would rear their ugly heads like purple dragons, and I had no doubt in my ability to slay racist nonsense whenever I found it. I was so wrong. Far from an imposing beast, I found that white supremacy is more like a poison. It seeps into your mind, drip by drip, until it makes you wonder if your perception of reality is true. Being a black woman in the professional world of majority white nonprofit ministries was far more difficult than my younger self could imagine. In school, I had been surrounded by whiteness, but colleges often encourage students to question authority, to navigate cultural conflicts, to be creative in starting alternative organizations and clubs. While every school certainly contains boundaries for students, at some basic level it is expected that students push those boundaries that they learn not only through books but through new experiences. The professional world, I soon discovered, is altogether different. Companies love talking about their diversity and inclusion efforts, but I remember one unusually frank conversation with our organization's board of directors, in which I learned how those efforts often work. Less than a year into the job, I was seeking approval for a new racial diversity training program. I knew that meeting wasn't going well when our treasurer said, just to play devil's advocate, and then posed a series of questions, speaking gently so as to preserve an air of innocence. Why don't we want assimilation? Isn't that the point of our organization's culture? Don't we want to bring in people of diverse backgrounds and then become one unified organization? My mouth dropped open, but the rest of my body froze. I had no idea how to speak truth to the person who held my program in his hands. How could I possibly explain that the unity he desired always came at my expense? I had worked for a number of organizations that struggled to create meaningful opportunities for people of color, but I had never heard anyone make an overt case in favor of assimilation particularly at an organization that promoted diversity in its mission statements and messaging. Granted, many people of color on our team had grown suspicious of those statements, suspecting that the organization wanted our racial diversity without our diversity of thought and culture. I just never imagined someone with his influence would say it aloud and with positivity. It's so easy to believe the pretty pictures on the website filled with racial diversity, to buy into the well-crafted statements of purpose, to enjoy being invited into the process of being part of a change, The role of a bridge builder sounds appealing until it becomes clear how often that bridge is your broken back. It usually begins with a job interview. Overcompensation is hard to resist in this moment. 
When you need a job and are generally drawn to the work describing in the job posting, it's tempting to sit in that seat and say all the right things, laugh the right laugh, extend all the right jokes. The goal, after all, is to impress. Do I make myself more likable? Do I use references to movies, music, books that I know the folks around the table would appreciate? References that would imply that I am just like you? Sometimes I just want to prove I can do it, that I can make them comfortable, make them believe. But the question is always, is it worth it? White institutions are constantly communicating how much blackness they want. It begins with numbers, how many scholarships are being offered, how many seats are being saved for neighborhood kids, how many black bodies must be present for us to have good diversity numbers, how many people of color are needed for the website, the commercials, the pamphlets. But numbers are only the beginning. Whiteness constantly polices the expressions of blackness allowed within its walls, attempting to accrue no more than what's necessary to affirm itself. It wants us to sing the celebratory We Shall Overcome during Martin Luther King Day, but doesn't want to hear the indicting lyrics of Strange Fruit. It wants to see a black person seated at the table, but doesn't want to hear a dissenting viewpoint. It wants to pat itself on the back for helping poor black folks through missions on urban projects, but has no interest in learning from black people's wisdom, talent, and spiritual depth. Whiteness wants enough blackness to affirm the goodness of whiteness, the progressiveness of whiteness, the open-heartedness of whiteness. Whiteness likes a trickle of blackness, but only that which can be controlled. Here's how all of this plays out if you're a black woman trying to survive in a culture of professional whiteness. 8.55 a.m. I arrive at work and walk through the lobby to get to my office. On the way, I am asked three times if I need help finding the outreach center. My white coworker, whose footsteps I hear behind me, is never asked this question. The message? I am a black woman, so I must be poor and in need of help. 8.58 a.m. I set my purse down in my cubicle. The white coworker who is walking behind me stares in shock. She's never seen me with my hair in a pineapple fro. She reaches out to touch my hair while telling me how beautiful it is. When I pull back, startled by the sudden act of intimacy, she looks hurt and isn't sure what to do next. The message, I am different, exotic. Anyone should have the right to my body in exchange for a compliment. 9.58 a.m. An hour later, I am asked to see my supervisor. When I get to her office, she asks me to shut the door. She tells me that she received a note saying that I made someone uncomfortable when they were just trying to be friendly and kind. She suggests that I work on being more of a team player and not being so closed off. I look at her incredulously. I now wonder if this is just about the one coworker, or if my supervisor gets emails about me every week from awkward white people. The message, I am responsible for the feelings of white people, and my boss will not defend me from these accusations. 10.05 a.m. I attempt to respond, but before I can finish, my supervisor asks if I don't mind changing my tone a bit. I sound angry, and she was just trying to help, trying to make sure I can stay here long term. I mumble something about my own frustrations, but they are dismissed with a wave of her hand and a promise to work with me. The message, my tone will be interpreted as angry, even if I'm just feeling hurt or misunderstood. My actual feelings are relevant and could be used as reason to fire me. 12 noon. It's lunchtime now, and I desperately need to talk to my girlfriends in another department. I find a seat among this group of women of color who use the lunch break to offer support and encouragement to one another. After talking with them for a little bit, I feel like I can't breathe again. Even though we don't work in the same departments, they are the reason I've survived here this long. I return to my office. 1 p.m. I have a project due at the end of the week, so I put on my headphones to block out the office noise while I work. Another team member comes to my door. Austin, can I talk to you for a second? Sure, I respond. I notice that you wear your headphones a lot in the office, she says. It sometimes feels like you don't want to be around us. I take a deep breath. Because we work in cubicles, many of us wear headphones when we need to focus. Mine aren't on more often than anyone else's. The message, my body is being scrutinized in ways that others are not subjected to, and the worst is being assumed of me. 1.05 p.m. I respond to the coworker, but quickly turn the conversation to the project we're working on together, hoping to discuss the changes I made that morning. 30 minutes into this conversation, I realize I'm answering questions about black music, a new segment on urban violence she saw the other night, and something her adopted black nephew said the other day. She emphasizes the word black, clearly not used to saying the word. I am tired. I am not sure what led us here. The message, I am here to educate my white coworkers when they are confused about a racial issue in their lives. 1.40 p.m. I take a deep breath. 
Hey, I need to stretch my legs. I'm going to get some coffee. You want anything? I don't like coffee, but I will get some anyway if it helps end this conversation. 1.50 p.m. Standing in line at the coffee shop next door, I quickly noticed a man who stopped me in the hallway and referred to me as colored. He had come to one session of my Tuesday night class on race and thought it appropriate to pepper me with questions about blackness, well, coloredness, since he decided not to continue coming. Rather than answer his questions on the spot, I told him he should come back to the next class, but now here he is behind me. Maybe he won't speak up, or maybe he'll think of me, think he has me confused with another black person. He doesn't say anything, but my body is stiff with anticipatory tension. 2.07 p.m. As soon as I get my coffee and turn toward the door, it happens. Someone I have never met insists that she emailed me and can't wait to chat more. She's right that we work at the same organization, but I've never seen this woman. I think you have me confused with someone else, I say. She insists that I'm wrong. Oh no, don't you remember? I stare at her blankly, my warm coffee reminding me that I'm not in the sunken place. I let her finish, then I repeat slowly, I think you have me confused with someone else. The explanation continues until I'm given enough information to know which black person she has me confused with. Nope, that's not me. You're talking about Tina in the communications department. She's amazing. You two will have a good talk, I'm sure. Her eyes grow wide, embarrassment climbing her face. I'm so sorry. I have to run. I say before the apologies get messy. The message? My body, my person is not distinct. I'm interchangeable with all other black women. 2.17 p.m. I'm back in my office, preparing for an afternoon staff meeting in which I will give a short presentation. I feel good about my content. I've worked hard on it, knowing my perspective is often different from my coworkers, but my heart still beats fast. How will I be received by my team? 2.30 p.m. I'm in the staff meeting. I give my eight-minute spiel. There is a pause and then some pushback. I know this was a possibility, so I hear them out, trying not to form a response as they speak. Another coworker pipes in before I can respond. I think what Austin is trying to say is, suddenly everyone is nodding in agreement even though I'm pretty sure she just repeated me almost word for word. The message, I need white approval and interpretation before my idea will be considered good. 3.30 p.m. The meeting has closed and some coworkers race behind to their cubicles. Even though I am behind on emails, I know that I must stay and chat. If I race back to my cubicle, it will be interpreted as me being antisocial. I stick around and make small talk, leaving with another coworker so that my body doesn't stand out. 3.40 p.m. I'm back in my office. I glance at the clock. There are still two more hours in the day. These are the daily annoyances, the subtle messages of whiteness, but we bear other scars too. Over and over, I've seen white men and women get praised for their gifts and skills while women of color are told only about their potential for leadership. When white people end up being terrible at their jobs, I've seen supervisors move mountains to give them new positions more suited for their talents, while people of color are told to master their positions or be let go. I've been in the room when promises were made to diversify boardrooms, leadership teams, pastoral staff, faculty and staff positions, only to watch committees appoint a white man in the end. It's difficult to express how these incidents accumulate, making you feel undervalued, unappreciated, and ultimately expendable. Over the years, I've grown used to hearing the response, well, why don't you just leave if you don't like it here? As if this experience is a unique phenomenon or specific to only a handful of delinquent organizations. Even if it were unique, it's highly privileged to believe that black women can just quit and find another place to work without missing paychecks or losing benefits. Just changing jobs is really that simple, so black women come up with life hacks. These life hacks don't involve nifty uses for egg cartons or finding unique ways to use paper clips. They involve helping one another write emails to our supervisors or coworkers, which we know will be scrutinized for tone. Our life hacks include keeping folders in our inboxes where we place every single email that praises our project, aptitude, or giftedness. This is not for our self-esteem, it's an insurance policy because we know there are emails being sent to our bosses that say the opposite. Our life hacks include finding a cohort, a girlfriend, an ally, someone who is a safe space, someone to have lunch with who doesn't need an explanation for our being. Our life hacks include secret Facebook groups where we process awkward interpersonal microaggressions and suggest ways to tackle them in the future. But for many of us, life hacks can't stop the inevitable. They can slow it down, yes, but eventually those of us who work for white Christians are asked the question, are you sure God has really called you here? And then I know just how invisible and dispensable I am. 
Rather than having a conversation about policy or assumptions or interactions, I am asked what God thinks about me. This is convenient because it allows the people in charge to wash their hands of the conflict, but the suggestion that I assimilate doesn't always come passive aggressively or with ill intent. Sometimes it sounds loving. It's been a hard week at the office because I work at a Christian organization. My coworkers ask if they can pray for me. I move that they notice my emotional distress. They gather round, lay their hands on my shoulders. I close my eyes and breathe deeply, listening to their words. But before I know it, the prayers take a turn. They are no longer about my circumstances, but about me. They ask not what, that I be understood, but that I would find it within myself to give more grace. The prayers don't ask that doors open for me. They ask that God would gift me with skills they wish I had. These prayers aren't for me. These prayers are that I would become who they want me to be. Lord, make this black person just like us. I'm not sure my coworkers even realize the difference. They've been praying the prayer for so long. In this way, whiteness reveals its true desire for people of color. Whiteness wants us to be empty, malleable, so that it can shape blackness into whatever is necessary for the white organization's own success. It sees potential, possibility, a future where black people could share some of the benefits of whiteness, if only we try hard enough to mimic it. The initial expectation is that I simply code switch, conforming to the cultural communication of white people when I'm with them. But in the end, this is never enough. The ultimate expectation is that I will come to realize that white ways of thinking, behaving, communicating, and understanding the world are to be valued above all else. Where is the ministry praying that they would be worthy of the giftedness of black minds and hearts? So we must remind ourselves, it's the only way to spit out the poison. We must remind ourselves and one another that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, arming ourselves against the ultimate message of whiteness, that we are inferior. We must stare at ourselves in the mirror and repeat that we, too, are fully capable, immensely talented, and uniquely gifted. We are not tokens. We are valuable in the fullness of our humanity. We are not perfect, but we are here, able to contribute something special, beautiful, lasting to the companies and ministries to which we belong. Thank you.